We're going to talk about politics inside of law firms and what an attorney needs to understand about politics. Politics is one of the more important things that attorneys need to be aware of when they're practicing because there's so many rules in every firm and every firm has a different culture. So understanding politics and some of the general rules we'll cover. I know of a couple of attorneys that I practice with that even were partners and quit, you know, when they were in their mid 40s just because they couldn't deal with the politics anymore. The scariest thing about being a partner in a law firm is not just the work, but the fact that your peers are all out to get you. And I hear that from partners all the time. I mean, partners actually seem like there's more stress for them from a political standpoint than a lot of associates. But there's some very basic rules that associates need to follow. It's difficult because when attorneys get into law firms, they don't really understand the rules. They have to kind of learn them as they go along. And some people understand political rules instinctively and others don't. A lot of times if your parents are an attorney or your parents are were professionals, you can kind of pick up on, you kind of understand those rules instinctively or from the things you picked up from your parents in terms of the way they spoke and stuff, you understand that. But if you're not out of a legal environment, then it can be very difficult. People that don't play the political game well lose their jobs. They don't protect their psychology, don't work with the right people. All sorts of things that they do that actually undermines their ability to succeed. There's always going to be people inside of a law firm that have problems, and they may have problems with other attorneys they're working with. They may have problems with the work itself. But in terms of having problems with a firm or people that they're working with, they want to have other people on their side, and that makes them feel okay. And so if someone's very critical of their work, maybe they'll try to make friends with someone that's working with the same person that was critical. And then they'll try to undermine the person's confidence. If somebody's unhappy with their job for one reason or another, they'll try to be close to other people and make them feel unhappy with their job. It's kind of a constant battle. People that are trying to be your friend a lot of times are people that are going to kind of drag down your mind. I remember I was at a firm and this woman that I was friends with wanted to complain about how awful the firm was, how bad everybody was, and how she needed to look for a job and all these things. And you know, I was in this office and there were like 100 plus people and working there and there were a lot of very successful people. And my realization was she was the one with the problem. So you just need to avoid people like that because they're going to compete with your mind space and, and hurt you and drag you down psychologically. You want to associate with people that are trying to do good things. And so people that are enthusiastic about their job, working hard, getting a lot of work and very involved and engaged. And you want to avoid people that aren't getting a lot of work that aren't involved and engaged. That's the main thing because the difference between being successful and there's some very, very successful people out there and then there's people that aren't successful. It's all about your mindset and the people you choose to associate with and the decisions you make. Every business and everything that happens to you is just a product of individual decisions you make. And some people make better decisions than others. And so if you're with the people that are unhappy, that's going to rub off on you. You want to be friends with people that are helping and not hurting the organization. Why would you want to associate with people that have negative feelings about the organization, negative feelings about the people in it? Because all they're doing is hurting the people that are giving you money and helping you survive. You want to be friends with people that are building it up. So in every organization, there's people that are pulling things down and there's people that are building things up. And so you want to be around with the people that are building things up. And those kind of people are very easy to spot. There's always going to be negative people in every organization. A good organization will expel those people. And a bad organization will allow those people to fester and create a giant wound that sometimes can't be reversed. As a general rule, you want to be seen as positive and upworking. You want to be seen as a good guy who's happy and nice and, or a good woman who's happy and nice and doing a good job and not concerning yourself with these petty issues. Those petty issues and things that people are upset about will always come along at any point in time. There's always going to be toxic partners in every law firm. There are people that have a difficult time getting others to work for them effectively. A lot of times they're just very curt. They don't give very clear instructions because they're too kind of in their head. And then if you don't do a good job for them, then they'll be very critical. A lot of times they don't think positively of the people that are working for them. And you can kind of tell based on the way they talk about associates or people that are working beneath them. They'll avoid people in the hall. They won't say hi to them. They may seem nice, but then they become overly critical. And so you want to avoid people that are toxic like that. I think the problem with a toxic partner is if you get under their skin or you don't do things the way they want, then they're going to be out for you or say negative things about you and poison your brand. And so you're all, your objective is always to keep your brand as strong as possible out of a firm. And the first thing is in terms of partners with a lot of business. A partner with a large book of business is the one that's going to have the most say in the firm generally because they're employing 
a lot of attorneys and they're paying the attorney's bills. Typically a law firm, if an attorney has a $10 million book of business, they're going to make anywhere between two and three or $4 million. But that other six million, um, you know, or, or eight million is money that's kind of going into the pot for the firm. And so the firm's going to stick up for people that have a lot of business like that. The firm's also going to listen to that person if they say, you know, we need to make this person a partner. Firms take partners with a lot of business very, very seriously because they rely on them. So working for people like that is important because that person has a lot of authority in the firm. They can protect you. Other people won't mess with you a lot of times because they want to get work from that partner too, you know, even other partners. And so you'll be protected and you can make partner much more easily. Or if you're a partner, they can continue to give you more work. If that partner leaves, if there's problems with the firm and they like you, they'll take you with you and other firms are more likely to want to take you. In addition, your question also, so why do you want to work with people that you're comfortable with? I mean, people that like see eye to eye with you and have the same sort of personality are going to be good people to work with in the long run because those people will help you and they're not going to be overly critical of you and they're going to see their faults and they may see your faults and want to help you instead of destroy you because of those faults and they help you along. There's an attorney that I know um, that I went to law school with that, um, you know, is now the head of a giant international law firm. And this guy was like just smiling all the time. Everywhere you go, he'd be smiling at people and, and being very nice to them. And he was like that in law school. And I don't think he was a particularly great student, but his personality was so pleasing and everyone liked him. So if everyone likes you, you know, you're likable by talking positively about other people, by not getting involved in politics, by being on the side of the people that are helping the firm and not hurting the firm. You're likable when you say hello to everyone and laugh at jokes and are always smiling and happy. Even if that doesn't help you in your existing firm, people remember the people that they like and they refer business to them and they refer things to them in the future. So that's also very helpful. So going out of your way to be liked in a good way is, is, is important. If you're a complainer, then you're kind of seen as, again, this person that's dragging the firm down as opposed to building it up. So within reason, it's okay to complain. When I was in a law firm once, there was an office that had toxic mold. <laughs> For some reason, this toxic mold was growing in this office and this, this guy's having these horrible allergies. This, like His head kind of blew up. It was working in there. He's a really nice guy. His family came over from Mexico and he was really excited to have this job and everything, but just having these horrible allergies and he didn't complain. Eventually the firm figured out that it was the office and said something. So you want to complain about something like that, but complaining about stupid things like our recruiter of ours was working with this candidate. He went to University of Chicago Law School. He's working at this giant firm in LA, like Winston and Strawn and a great firm, great job, great work he was getting. I guess they moved their parking garage like across the street from the main office. But he was very upset about that and complained and made a big deal out of it. It was actually looking for a job because he didn't like the fact that they moved the parking garage. And you know, that's the idea of a complainer. So you don't want to have a huge ego and think you're better than everyone. You want to be seen as someone that will put their foot down and just get things done. There's an article that I wrote, it's on my blog. It's called A Message to Garcia in Your Career. And that article basically discusses a guy that was given this task to do, and he just went and did it. My article is based on a short book that was written called A Message to Garcia. The person would just go and get it done. And they, was, they were given this task, and they did all these things to achieve it, and they got it done. And the idea was this person didn't complain. They had to go through rivers and do all these things and hike and do this very difficult job to, get, to deliver this message to Garcia. And they said that most people, if they were faced with that task, would have found reasons not to do it. They would have complained and created problems. But the person that doesn't complain is really the best. And I like that. So you just don't complain. You get your stuff done. You put your head down. You do the work. And that's it. Because anybody can complain, but very few people cannot. If an attorney speaks negatively about others in the law firm, that can have disastrous ramifications. I knew a guy that had worked for a partner in a law firm I was in for I think three or four years and then worked very closely with him. And then they got back to the partner that he, he'd said some negative things about him behind his back. And they weren't that bad. It was something about the partner's writing ability or something. But the partner was very self-conscious about his writing ability. And it got back to him and that partner just cut him off from giving any work. And his friends didn't give that guy any work anymore. And that was it. So the guy didn't have any work anymore. So 
If people think negatively of you because you said something bad about them, I mean, if people are upset about it, then they can react in, in different ways. Even if a secretary hears you say something bad about her and the word gets out, she, she can sabotage you. If one of your peers hears you say something bad about them, they can sabotage you. So you want everybody on your side. You don't want people against you. So the best thing you can do is really not say anything negative about anybody. And the smart attorneys always do that. I mean, they'll never say something directly they may apply it, but you never want to say anything negatively because they won't trust you with information. They'll think you're disloyal and all sorts of things. Well, FaceTime is very important inside of law firms and for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons is just that if other people are working, they want to be around with other people are working. Partners want to be able to stop by your office and talk to you about something. They want to be able to ask questions. And the perception is a lot of times is if you're not in the office and you're not seen working, that maybe you really aren't working or you're not part of the group. People are kind of tribal. They want to all be working together. And the importance of billing enough hours and for a firm is huge. That's how firms make money. So no one's ever going to tell you not to, not to work and not to bill hours, but they would prefer, most law firms would prefer if you did it in the firm, as opposed to elsewhere. Every attorney wants to you believe when there's assigning work or every client wants to believe that what you're doing for them is the most important thing in the world. And, and they want to feel that if you're doing a certain assignment for them, that you take it more seriously than anything and you're going to eat, breathe and sleep. But because a client, for example, could be facing a huge lawsuit that could close their business or it could be fa you know, needed to raise money or do something important with intellectual property. I mean, you just never know. So everybody that is giving you work wants to feel like it's the most important thing. A partner wants to impress their clients you know, and wants the client to get a good result. And so... Everybody needs to believe you're behind. You take the work very seriously. I was talking to an attorney recently that had let an associate of his go, and he said that she just didn't seem to care. She kind of thought everything was stupid, and she knew the work, she knew how to do it, but she didn't think too highly of the kind of work she was doing and thought she was better than it. And so he let her go because of that. And the fact that she didn't take the work that seriously and didn't think very highly of it, she'd also made a lot of mistakes, careless mistakes in her writing and so forth. So clients want to believe you take the work seriously. I mean, one of the most famous and sexual, successful attorneys I ever knew was John Quinn. He used to tell clients, even when the firm was small, like 15 attorneys, that if you give me this matter, I'll eat, breathe, and sleep it. Then he said that when the firm was 30 attorneys, and then when it was 60, and then when it was 90. He kept saying it to clients, and people want to think that. I mean, that's what grows a firm. And that's what grows your practice, too, if you're trying to represent people. They want to feel the same way. Every good attorney that builds a lot of hours or has a very successful and thriving practice will always find work to be done. And if you think about it, creating work is one of the most important categories or things that an attorney can do. This is something that everybody learns how to do that's successful at anything. Even a beggar on the street that's coming up and spraying who knows what on your windshield and wiping it off with a newspaper has figured out how to create work. It's better to do that to make money than it is to sit on the ground with a hat in front of you. So the people that create the most work are the ones that are the most successful. They find work to be done. I mean, Amazon's an example, delivering books, that's, that's work to be done. And then after books, it was electronics or CDs or you know whatever. So creating work to be done is the most important thing. So a good attorney will always find more and additional matters to work on for their clients. They will find bigger matters and things that need to be done in a backlog of work and will always be creating new ideas and projects. And frankly, a lot of them are unethical about it. I mean, if you do it ethically, that's the right thing to do. You need to find additional work that can be done for partners. You need to find partners need to find additional work that can be done for their clients or other partners are getting work from. So creating work is the most important thing in any business because if no one's creating work, then there's no business. And it's the same thing with a law firm. So it's the most important thing. You need to always be creating work to be done and thinking about it when you're working on things. In a lot of law firms, uh, people will be talking about going in-house. They'll be talking about other things they want to do, going to work in the U.S. Attorney's Office or whatever. And you know, the second you start doing that, you've opened yourself up to looking not committed and other people to looking committed. You want to look committed. Anytime you share a weakness or anything that people can use to undermine you, that's going to be a problem inside of a law firm. So you should never tell people you want to be doing something else. You should never tell people even your personal problems if they're halfway serious. You shouldn't share anything with people because they'll use it against you and that will make you look not committed. You always want to make sure you look as committed as you possibly can. Lying is a big deal. There can be different types of lies and sometimes law firms will overlook lies. I mean, it doesn't 
it doesn't really matter. But if you lie to someone in your law firm and it gets back, depending on how serious it is, you're suddenly not trusted. And lying is kind of also a form of weakness. People lie when they're scared, when they're not confident in who they are. And so it, it's kind of like something that undermines your ability to be a strong attorney. Well, it depends on the mistakes. So a lot of times, you know, attorneys will deflect mistakes. You know, a lot of the best attorneys, like if they're confronted with their mistakes, like they just won't say anything. Like if you tell the attorney, like a good attorney, like what they did wrong, the attorney won't say anything. They won't admit it. They won't, they just won't say anything. So and that's their way of taking responsibility a lot of times. Like the best attorneys typically will very rarely say, I'm sorry or whatever. They'll just kind of like protect themselves, which is kind of, it's kind of funny. You know, attorneys, I don't know where they learn it, but you do have to take responsibility for your mistakes. If you make a mistake, you need to fess up to it and fix it. A lot of times attorneys will even try to blame other people or find reasons that something didn't happen. If you're confronted with a mistake, it's obvious you made it, and people are asking you for an explanation, you need to just give an explanation. This and this and this happened, and that's why it happened. But even when you do take responsibility for your mistakes, I mean, depending on the mistake, you may end up losing your job. I mean, I know one attorney who had done all these deals in the, over the past month or something, he'd been working on a deal almost every night, and he just, the Final night, he was up till four in the morning. He was expected to be in the office at 9 a.m. just to go over documents for a deal. He didn't, he slept in because he was so exhausted and then he ended up losing his job for that. So it just depends. And even though he took responsibility. So, but you also need to be able to take responsibility if your peers make a mistake too. Social events are just because you want to be seen supporting the firm. You also want to be in an atmosphere where to some extent, people are letting their guard down, talking about personal things, or vaguely personal things, as opposed to the way they talk when they're acting professional. It's also a good opportunity to bond with other attorneys and create relationships with people that you might not normally come across through the course of doing your assignments and maybe get work for them. So as a partner or as an associate, you should always view going to social events as a lobbying opportunity to get yourself known and you know, to bond with the right people and to meet the right people, people that can have a lot of power over your career. So social events are important. Business generating events are also an important thing for attorneys to go to. It's something that, you know, it can teach you the skills that you need to do pitches in the future. If you're a partner and asked to go to pitching events, a lot of times partners hate it because it's not their client or whatever, but a lot of times you can find work that you could do for their client if it's someone else's when they're asking you to go. I saw a partner recently that was fired for not going to a pitch event. Or he went to the pitch event and then he acted inappropriately because he was mad because he had to get up at like 3 a.m. and fly to another city and be at this pitch event in the morning. He finally got there and was very mad. So it's important to go to pitch events. If you criticize the management, you know, it depends on what your partner or associate. But if you're a partner, I mean, you're going to end up on the wrong side of the, the issue half the time. And if you upset people, they can come. They might be interested in coming after you or getting mad. One instance I, I brought up that I thought was very interesting is when I was in a firm, there was a meeting. Um, this is actually when I was a summer associate. And then I was in a big New York law firm. And there was a meeting where they talk about their pro bono or something. And so this attorney was in charge of pro bono in the firm. He was a senior associate and a couple of attorneys from the management committee are there and all the summer associates and a bunch of other associates. And this guy got up and he said, this firm is the worst record in the city for pro bono and we're just concerned about money and this is horrible and all this kind of stuff. And I could see that the people in management in the firm were very nervous about it because not only did he say something that was probably true, but it was embarrassing for them, but it was more embarrassing because there were these summer associate classes there that were gonna go back to their respective law schools and stuff. So what I noticed over the next several weeks, because in the summer is that I just kept seeing partners yelling at this guy in the hall and like, whereas before he looked very happy and I kind of saw just his appearance and everything over the course of you know three months or whatever, just kind of degrade to like a look of like fear and nervousness and in my first law firm, a guy actually called up a newspaper to talk about a case and criticized the way that the firm was handling the case. And he too was out of a job. So you just have to be very careful politically about anything to do with management. You don't want to say anything negative. They'll just know that they can't trust you. If you talk about one peer to one, another peer uh, negatively, or you have a habit of doing that, then the people that are listening to this will know that you're likely to talk the same about them. So they'll avoid you and won't want to be around you if they're smart. If you talk about your personal life in the office, it can have disastrous consequences. I knew of a woman that had met some guy in an airport lounge or something, talked to him for 10 minutes. He got her phone number and they called up and they talked. This was before people were internet all the time. And um, talked to her and then went out and visited her 
San Jose or wherever she was, and then I mean, then spent the weekend with her, you know, having a having a lot of fun. I mean, sexually, I guess. And and then when she came back to work on Monday, she told this partner that she worked with very closely, who was a woman, what a great weekend she had with this person she'd only met for five minutes in an airport lounge, and the partner was very offended by that and stopped giving her work and. That was the end of her job within a few months. So you just never know how people are going to react when they hear about your personal life. They could react in a very negative way. I've seen lots of people date in the office. And the problem with dating is most relationships end. And when they end, they can end badly. I've known of several instances just in law firms I've worked in. But I've heard of a lot where people get temporary restraining orders or sexual harassment suits are filed and so forth. And it's just... It's not worth it. It's just crazy. And your whole like reputation and stuff can be destroyed by someone getting mad or some word getting out. Or God forbid, if you date multiple people and are in the same office, that can have consequences. I knew of an extremely powerful partner, like one of the top partners in this practice group in the country that decided to date an associate in his firm. And then the relationship ended. And then two or three years later, the woman's boyfriend found out about it and was very upset because he'd been her boyfriend at the time this was going on and called up the firm and talked to them about it and got an attorney involved and then they the law firm had to settle for a, a large amount of money and the partner lost his job because you just can't make stupid mistakes like that and women too i mean women dating in the office when things go bad i mean can also lead to lots of trouble so everyone has to be careful People use their, their work phones and their computers and the office and stuff all the time. And they're under the expectation that there's some sort of privacy when you're talking to the phone privately or when you're using the internet. Law firms will listen to your phone conversations. I mean, now there's software that can transcribe your phone calls, I mean, automatically. I mean, you have really no expectation of privacy when you're working in a law firm. I don't know of law firms in particular that are doing this right now, but I do know, I remember again, when I was working as a summer associate, I went into this room and when I was working late at night one night and there was a, they had a bank of computers and they were monitoring phone calls. Back then I probably took a bank, right now I just take one, but you know, they're monitoring phone calls or recording them and they have to do that because this particular firm was working for, you know, big companies that were doing, you know, stock trades or, I mean, not mergers and things like that. So there's probably some reason they were doing that, and they're doing it to protect themselves. It's not like they're evil institutions. But another thing that law firms do, and I think lots of law firms do this, I don't know how many, but they will record your screen when you're working. So I had two things that come to mind. One time an attorney posted something on an online news magazine about his firm, and the law firm found out it was him, even though he posted anonymously, like within an hour or two of him posting it, because they had been recording his screen as well as other, every other attorney's screen in the, in, the, in the firm. And then I had an instance where I was working with a group of four or five partners and they were moving firms and this thing was about ready to happen. A couple of days away, they were all gonna move. The law firm had been recording their screens and so they'd been logging onto the personal email and stuff from work. And then the law firm like showed them like, you know, we know you're moving, here's a proof. And, you know, so these guys didn't even know their law firm was doing that. And then they prevented them from moving with counter offers or whatever the firm needed to do. All those cases where the firm does that, I mean, the firm's protecting itself. And I'm not saying the firms are wrong for doing it, but you got to be careful. Well, you just need to avoid the partners with bad reputations. Hopefully you can work with a partner with a lot of business. It's likely to give you good reviews. Typically, if you... If you're not connecting with someone, different personality type, if you don't have anything in common, and the relationship is very kind of distant and so forth, and that's kind of the kind of partner you may want to avoid because you're probably not going to get the best reviews from that sort of person. So you want to work with people you're comfortable with and where you think the work you're doing you can excel when you're comfortable with and you're interested in the work. I think a lot of attorneys will take on more work than they can handle. If an attorney does good work, other people will seek them out, or if their firm's very busy, people will try to give them more work. But if the quality of your work, you make mistakes or you blow deadlines, then other attorneys will be very, very angry with you. And that can quickly destroy your reputation. So every attorney needs to be careful about taking on too much work. It can hurt you a lot. And it happens to a lot of attorneys because they don't want to say no to taking on work. But if you 
take on too much work, you're going to be much worse off than if you do a better job with the existing assignments that you have. Your job as an attorney is to go and research and figure things out. So there's a lot of benefits, a lot of downsides if you require a lot of handholding. If you can't go figure things out, then other attorneys are going to assume that you're not willing to think, and research, and think for yourself and figure things out. One of the things that attorneys are tested on when they try to go to law school are these things called games, which are like these little puzzles, you know, which are kind of interesting because everybody looks at these games and they don't make a lot of sense. And then you have to think about it and apply yourself and figure things out. And, and that's something I think that good attorneys do is they look at an assignment and they figure out what does this person mean by this? Where's the solution? What does my assignment mean? And they can do that without asking a lot of questions because People want to be able to tell you something and then for the result to show up. And they don't want to have to tell you something and then have you bother and pick and ask them all sorts of questions. That's a sign of someone that's not professional um, or very good at their job. And someone that's very good at their job is likely to be able to get things done quickly without a lot of intervention on your behalf. So if you annoy people when you, you give them work and you don't take time to figure things out and anticipate their needs, then they're not going to want to give you assignments in the future. So you want to make sure that you don't annoy people and anticipate their needs. It's not just hygiene, I mean, but yeah, dressing nicely is important um, and looking good in the office. Everybody's a product. And so as a product, you have to think of, would you want this person representing me? So when a partner's thinking about who do they want to bring along to pitches or who do they want working with them, they want someone that's going to make them look impressive to clients, not just someone who's very smart, but someone who looks good and is going to give off the right sort of image. Statistically, like very tall men or football players and stuff that go to a good law school. I mean, these are the people that do the best. A lot of times in law school, very attractive women do very well. A lot of times if they have, if they're smart and work hard and do all these things. So looking good, conducting yourself professionally is important. The better you dress, you know, the better off you're doing. I mean, if an attorney is charging, you know, a lot of money per hour, the client wants to feel like when that person shows up that they're really representing them in a really good way. Remember that you're a product, every other attorney in your firm's a product, and you want to look like the best product. In a branch office, it's much more difficult to make partner for one. Branch offices, you won't have contact a lot of times with the people that are making the decisions and that are in power. So one example would be a few New York law firms, very prestigious law firms that have offices in Los Angeles, and some have been here 20 years or more, and they've never made a partner in all of LA, which is just hard to believe, but it's true. The partners are all sent out from New York, those staff these offices. A lot of times people don't make partner in these offices because they don't have any contact with the decision-making people that are in power in the main office. And so it's much more difficult in a branch office to make partner. It's also a lot of more times more difficult to get access to work. So if there's not a lot of work being generated in your local office, it's coming out of the, the main office and it may be more difficult to get work. So I think the politically, if you're in a branch office, it's important to travel to the main office as much as you can, to form as good a relationships as you can with the people in the main office, and to make sure that you're seen and heard from as much as you possibly can. Unless you're working with a very powerful partner in your office as a huge book of business. But even then, the partners in the main office are gonna wanna see you, especially the important ones. When I talk to associates, there really should be no such thing as a draft. You may put draft on it. It may require more thought to be perfect. But in terms of typos, logic errors and things, there should be none. Whether you're showing that to a client or you're showing it to another attorney. If you show something with typos and stuff on it to a client, the client's going to assume that your logic and your thought process is also um, problems with that because if you can't get the writing and stuff right how could you possibly get the, the material like the difficult thought done correctly as well so that's the thing and a lot of attorneys like they're so wound up about creating a perfect product especially in large law firms that if you give them something that's got typos in it I mean they'll take it as a sign of disrespect like why would you show something like this to me so you have to do a very good job with your work as much as you can it always should be quality work the first time and if you don't do it the first time and you are training in poor quality work, then attorneys won't give you work anymore. Well, I mean, weekends and holidays, I mean, are something that very few attorneys, they want to go home or they want to do things. And um, you certainly can, but the best attorneys are always going to be available on weekends and holidays. And a lot of times we'll even be working. The first thing, which is the most obvious, is you're expected to be kind of a billing machine. And if you're not billing, then there's not revenue coming in in those days for the firms. And law firms are businesses, so they want you working as much as possible. And a greater macro level, I mean, in a more obvious level, you know, if you're an attorney, it's no different than being a doctor. 
I mean, clients have emergencies. Those emergencies may be dragged out over several days, but some of those days may come in holidays. And that means that there's a deadline coming up or there's something big happening that the attorney needs to work for. And just because you have a holiday doesn't mean any of that stuff stops. If someone chooses to become an attorney, it's no different than becoming a doctor. I mean, people get sick on Christmas and they get sick on different holidays and they have emergencies and so do clients. And so you can't believe that it's all about yourself. You know, you have to be available on those days. And part of being a high level professional is making sure that you always are available.